Welcome to this episode of Fossils and Fiction, a podcast that explores the stories of prehistoric life, most often through the stories we humans tell about it. It's produced by me, Travis Holland, with support from Charles Sturt University. Enjoy. This week on Fossils and Fiction, an interview with the author of a new book called The Age of Mammals, Nature, Development and Paleontology in the Long 19th Century. The author is Chris Manius, who is an historian of science based at King's College London, where he is Senior Lecturer in the History of Science and Technology. Chris was generous enough to provide a review copy of the book via the publisher University of Pittsburgh Press, and it was a fantastic and interesting conversation about the history of the paleontology of mammals. Here now on this episode of Fossils and Fiction. Chris, hi, thanks so much for joining my podcast. Could you tell me a little bit about your career and how you got here, the pathway that kind of led you up to writing this book, which we're going to talk about today, uh, which is about the paleontology or the history of the paleontology of mammals. Yeah, thanks, Travis, and thanks for the um, invitation. So um, I suppose like most people, you invite onto this um, podcast. I was, when I was young, very interested in prehistoric animals and the deep past. I was sort of probably the generation just before Jurassic Park, or that was mm -hmm. the my kind of entry point into it. So I did always have a more diverse kind of set of interests in the paleontological past. So I was always interested in um, yeah, all different areas of um, yeah, deep time and evolutionary development. Um, but that kind of went into a bit of an abeyance when I was doing my undergrad studies. So I trained as a historian, um, as an undergraduate of my master's and for my PhD. And I was particularly interested in, well, the development of scholarly fields that have to do with ideas of change and development over time. So particularly subjects like archaeology, I wrote quite a lot on um, anthropology and kind of mm -hmm. comparative linguistics. These were sort of my early interests, um, but not just developing as scholarly or, scholarly or scientific fields, but in terms of their implications for bigger cultural, political and social processes. So the work coming off my PhD was very much about how ideas of ancient national history and origins connected with conceptualizations of race and um, nationhood in 19th century Europe. So that's really my kind of, um, yeah, my sort of initial background. Um, as I was doing my PhD work, though, I became increasingly interested in how human prehistory was being worked into all of these discourses. So which is a really dramatic and a really seismic field, which um, really expands very dramatically from the 1850s and 1860s onwards in European contexts and really makes a huge impact in demonstrating that human existence isn't just confined to the 6,000 years of biblical chronology, but really stretches back into the geological past, which is at that period well, well known, um, and really leads to a whole lot of very, very complicated thoughts on change, development, and the nature of humanity. So that was that kind of element. Um, the history of paleontology aspects really developed um, in my, well, my sort of second research job after my PhD, which was um, being drafted in as a historian of science attached to a project looking at comparative histories of colonialism in China. So how different European powers um, and also the United States become embroiled within China in the latter part of the 19th century and early 20th century and become yep. and it becomes a field for lots of different kind of political interests. Um, and so I was kind of working out a history of science project that might fit into this. And it really struck me that lots of um, scholarly teams were coming into China from France, from the UK, from the US, um, to a lesser extent from Germany, conducting lots of research in paleontology. And this really kind of piqued my interest and brought up all sorts of um, ideas and connotations I've been developing for a very, very, very long time. And I initially thought that when I was going to be looking at history of paleontology in China, that it will all be about dinosaurs. It would be about people going to China in the 1920s, 1930s and digging up dinosaur fossils and attempting to put them in museums. And there was a bit of that, 
but I was finding that within the actual primary material and within the kind of scholarly agendas of the people driving forward these processes, they were inordinately focused on mammals and fossil mammals and also to a kind of also to a quite significant degree human evolution that was kind of linking up with that. And that really just got me thinking like, why why were people in this period so interested in mammals and why has this been neglected? Why has it been missed that mammals were so conceptually important and also politically significant in this earlier period of the discipline and also the earlier period of the popularization and presentation of the discipline to wider audiences? This book that you've published is called The Age of Mammals, and it reads as a bit of a um, a corrective. You, you kind of mentioned, you know, people were focusing on dinosaurs, and specifically in the 19th century, uh, and that kind of history there. But to me, it reads as a corrective or a sort of resuscitation of that history that we have forgotten, I think, in the modern dinosaur mania. And I'm certainly guilty of that. <laughs> I think there were a couple of people I've invited on the podcast and they kind of said, you just talk about dinosaurs. And I said, that wasn't the plan. <laughs> we get carried away. So is that how is that how you see the book as well then? Um, to a degree, yeah. Um, there, having having said that, there has been quite a number of good books made by paleontologists recently, mm-hmm. um, which are attempting to kind of argue that, um, well, fossil mammals are interesting and important in lots of different ways. So I'm thinking, particularly, well, a particularly good example is Elsa Pancharoli's um recent mm-hmm. book, Beasts Before Us, which is a really great book both on um yeah early mammal evolution, but also the history of research into it in the early 20th century. Um. But the book, this book is on the one hand, yes, saying that we do need to pay attention to this history, but it's also um, aiming to kind of look at a time when mammals were conceptually important and significant and almost like the go-to fossils within um, paleontological discourse and Mm -hmm. and popularisation. So it's attempting to revive that sort of history and that sort of significance um and also um i think we'll get onto this later um is it's also not a history which is saying that this was inevitably a kind of good thing or a kind yeah. of or a, because a lot of the uses to which mammals were put in the 19th century are things which we would now rightly regard as quite disturbing and quite troubling um so that's one kind of aspect so, and, and another kind of aspect which i think is quite important to draw up to draw out is that obviously if we're thinking about paleontological popular popularization nowadays then it is very very dinosaur centric so and has been for the last 20 30 years at least um and that would be the kind of go to or, or just the kind of basic assumption that people would have if they're thinking about paleontology and the deep past like there may be a bit about human evolution like that's also a very resonant topic and a bit about you know the ice age which, which would be another sort yep. of thing that people would very often kind of uh pin on to um but the much sort of more stratified and much more layered conceptualization of the past which paleontologists would have and also which very much existed within the 19th century um has kind of been lost and it's sort of an idea which i think we do need to kind of get to grips with that 19th century popularizations and presentations of the fossil past are actually a lot more diverse and a lot more varied than our current understandings it is interesting that there is this kind of turn um perhaps as part of that that shift away from the the famous <laughs> dinosaur discoveries or the dino mania. Um, I'll phrase it that way, even if you're not quite willing to. But <laughs> look, early on in the book, you, you talk about uh, Cuvier, who is, of course, one of the, the most famous paleontologists in history, describing his process for, for reassembling complete fossils from disarticulated fossils. I looked at the book and I thought, there's so much there. It's really quite... Um, quite densely packed full of uh, anecdotes and resources and histories from all over the world. Did you find that that came together easily? Was it ordered or was it reassembled from, from disorder in the same way that Cuvier described it? Um, yeah, it was obviously a complicated thing to put together, as I'm sure you could get mm. from sort of looking at the thing. It's, it's, it's long covers um, very, very wide variety of different countries and um, a long chronology as well. So stretching really from the 1770s, 1780s up until the First World War. So was a long and complicated thing to put together. Um, I probably wouldn't use the 
Cuvier analogy um, of kind of um, things naturally fitting together because of the genius of the kind of of the, of the comparative anatomist who can do this because of their. But he was um, wrong anyway half the time. So <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, he was okay with the animals he was describing, so the Paleotherium and the Anoplotherium, but a few of the others, yeah, the um, the, the giant tapir, which turned out which he imagined to be about I think eight meters long, um, but which turned out to be a different animal, um, which he deduced from a tooth that turned out to be wrong, but it wasn't interesting kind of uh yeah thing drawing from his assumptions um but no, no so what I, I definitely wouldn't kind of position myself as being like Cuvier nor, nor what I'd like to be it was pro- the, the kind of metaphor I'd probably use is another metaphor drawn from the material in the book it was like a very complicated layered long durational set of geological processes with things mm. um, layering on top of one another with things being reworked with things coming to the fore and then being covered again um, and being worked and sort of reworked through a lot of different things over quite a long period of time um yeah mm. and to, to stretch the geological metaphor sometimes you have things sort of erupting to the surface and forcing themselves through yeah, <laughs> i guess yeah, forcing yeah, yeah, themselves yeah. through the story <laughs> um Okay, so you mentioned uh, some of the ways that paleontology was kind of used, uh, that it fitted into kind of government um, efforts at the time in colonialism and in exploration and all sorts of things. Could could you talk a little bit about that? What was what was happening there? How was paleontology tied up with some of those uh, bigger movements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things which I was really interested in doing with the book was. Um, not just writing the history of paleontology as a scientific field, but writing about how looking at the history of paleontology can tell us bigger things about um, the large changes which are happening within the 19th century. And paleontology is kind of deeply, deeply entangled with a lot of major things which are happening. And two of the most notable and two of, and quite closely linked things which I tried to draw out in the book as much as possible were, on the one hand, the growth of new types of economies based around the extraction of mineral resources Mm -hmm. and the building of new large-scale agricultural systems, but also the rise of colonialism, empires of various different forms. And paleontology and the fossil mammal research, which I'm kind of tracing in the book, is really closely connected with that in a number of different ways. Like, firstly, there's the ideological connections, which are really, really important, because what paleontology and mammal paleontology in the 19th century is doing a lot of the time in this period is giving particular values and giving particular sets of cultural assumptions to entire landscapes and entire territories, which are partly based on, well, observations and projections of the modern environment, the modern fauna and modern people living within them, but also is deeply entangled with understandings of the deep past. So, for example, there's the kind of cultural construction of, say, South America as a land on the one hand in the kind of Western colonial imagination of kind of tropical exuberance um, and in some respects kind of degeneration in terms of life and in terms of the um, human societies living within them. So there's an idea with that kind of indigenous societies in South America have been degraded and declined from, from, from kind of former states. Um, but also there's a really, really long standing um, and to us quite well, both strange and troubling assumption in the 19th century that Tropical environments lead to the development of strange, degenerated and kind of uh, overly exuberant sort of forms of life, which on the one hand is projected onto the modern South American fauna with ideas like, say, the toucan being a monstrosity and being a kind of creature which is um, yet almost impossible to place. But it's also undeveloped through understandings of South American fossil life. And particularly things like, well, giant sloths, which are one of the first um, extinct animals to be kind of reconstructed and understood as extinct animals. And also, you can probably see them in the back behind me. Um, I've got two models of glyptodonts, so kind of Mm -hmm. quite large armadillo-like creatures from South America, which, again, are taken as being very, very large and strange. And this is something which feeds very much into kind of ideological constructions of South America itself um, and its position within particular structures of hierarchy and domination. Um, You see a similar thing within kind of valuations of what we might term the kind of global north 
in the 19th century, where obviously there's an assumption in the 19th century and which carries on well into the 20th century that, um, well, Eurasia and North America are where is where kind of global progress happens and where sort of, um, yeah, imperial structures of, of dominance, dominance kind of emanate from. But that's also parallels in understandings of paleontology. Um, so particularly North American scholars very often like to talk about the whole of the Northern Hemisphere being this biogeographic zone that they call Holarctica. And this is where the most progressive animals originate, which would be things like horses, um, or big cats, bears, yeah. um, dogs, um, camelids and so on, and kind of move out and conquer from this region. And so it's a really, really clear sort of projection of stereotypes of this Northern superiority onto the history of life. So you've got these ideological currents, but then you've also got the material currents around paleontological connections with imperialism and extractivist economics. And one thing that was really, really striking from the book is that the stereotype, which is often presented within paleontological literatures of um, paleontolog paleontology being driven forward by kind of, uh, yeah, very masculine um, scientific prospectors going out in cowboy hats or pith helmets, depending on the kind of environment yeah. they're going out into and excavating fossils. Um, this kind of stereotype um, didn't really map on to how most fossils and most kind of sites were exploited in the 19th century. In most cases, fossils were excavated in the course of mining, agricultural digging, building canals, building roads, these sorts of economic processes. They'd be found by local people who would have their own kind of understandings of them. And then the scientific prospectors would come in and um, either take over the sites or leverage control over them in particular ways and give them these new meanings attached to um, these kind of imperial understandings of the deep past. There's so many threads to to unpack there. It's interesting to find that coming out of um, out of North America, which you know in itself is is a kind of colony, but I guess the the notion of this um, pan hemispheric um, community uh, is kind of uh you know in the same way i think you mentioned at some point that the, the british and the french saw themselves as the sort of true inheritors of greek and roman antiquity it's almost that right the the americans picking picking up that thread and saying well this gives us the grounding in the natural world as well um and in the continent even though you know the the, the people doing that ex exploitation or that exploration were relative newcomers as well. There's a fantastic quote as you were talking about the um, the Americans in particular. I was uh, just searching through the quotes I've written down and you wrote uh, in the book, the American fossil hunter was as much a scientific prospector testing his strength against the environment as a museum-based scholar. How do you see that kind of, that's the stereotype you're talking about as fitting in the scientific literature, but which maybe was obscuring something as you know, myth building as much as anything. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the construction, particularly in the American context of um, the paleontologist being connected with, um, yeah, the conquest of the and invasion and annexation of the continental interior from the indigenous peoples living in the region. Um, this is a major part of the ideological, ideological construction of US paleontology in particular. And you'll see this in the imagery, which is very much associated with paleontology in the latter part of the 19th century, where they will very often dress either when they're in the field or quite often in photography studios when they come back from the field in this kind <laughs> of stereotypical Western garb with um, kind of yeah, cowboy hats um, and kind of buckskin um, with bowie knives and so on. And this um, kind of stereotype of the paleontologist as like a scientific cowboy is one which was entrenched within the 19th century. It's really prominent within public within public discourse around paleontology um, all through the 20th century and up until the present. And it's also something which modern paleontologists are trying to deconstruct because it mm -hmm. is tied with these legacies and histories of the discipline, which are now rightly regarded as being very, very, very problematic and kind of cuts off other roots and other sort of ways of thinking about yourself as being a paleontologist too. And so for paleontologists who are attempting to diversify the field now, which lots of them are, then attempting to deconstruct this stereotype is a really, really important drive and a really important kind of thing which is happening right now.
And there's also, you know, a, a kind of modern paleontologist who's very much lab based as well, I guess, or, or mm. even computer based. There's a lot more computer modeling and things going on nowadays too, which, you know, is just as much a part of the the, the, the science um, as getting out into the field and digging up the bones, even. So, um, you have several sections on Australia. I had this really, really quite surreal moment where I was texting back and forth with a colleague, and we were talking about um, the potential relationship between uh, finding fossils and and First Nations people. And then I turned the page and he had an account of finding the Wellington Caves and the kinds of stories and, and um, myths that were associated with that from, I think it would have been the Wiradjuri people. And the Wellington Caves is is literally just up the road from, from where I am. It's kind of within the foot footprint of my multi-campus university, uh, just, just a couple hours drive. And uh, I was really struck by that. But then later on, I was pleased to find you had basically a whole chapter dedicated to the lands of the Diprotodon. Uh, and you were talking about the Diprotodon and, and Australian paleontology in general. I think paleontology is not um, very well publicly known here. Australian paleontology is not very well known here. Like much of other culture, we import what we know from the US and people talk about American dinosaurs more than they talk about any any local ones. Why did you decide to focus on um, some of those really charismatic Australian mammals? Yeah, no, it's, it's curious you should say that because in terms of, well, both the history of science literature and environmental history literature, which I was using a lot when developing this book, then, um, yeah, Australian scholars and Australian kind of historians and historians of science and environmental historians are very much, um, well, leaders in the field and have um, really, really interesting kind of conceptual ways of understanding how, um, yeah, identities, how political structures and societies relate to environmental issues often occurring on a very sort of long time scale. Um, yeah, on, on the history of Australian paleontology, then I could obviously only touch on it a bit. Like there's a really um, fantastic book by um, Kirsty Douglas called um, Pictures mm -hmm. of Time Beneath, which is all about the position of the deep past in Australia from the early part of the 19th century up until the 1990s and look, going into the Diprotodon case study in much more depth than I could, but also talking about, um, yeah, invertebrate paleontology, glaciation and so on. So there's lots of really, really interesting stuff around the cultural resonances of paleontology in Australia, but I suppose it's very varied in terms of how much that gets picked up on within broader popular culture. Um, in terms of why there is quite a lot of Australia within the book um it's partly because yeah i've just found australian scholarship along these lines just so productive to work with um so i wanted to engage with it very um directly um but then there's also the ways in which um australia is really really significant within debates within um well natural history in general within the 19th century and also shows very very interesting things about relationships between different places and different localities which is a major theme within the book um so in terms of like, like the position of australia within kind of contemporary natural history then this is something which will be familiar i think to most listeners and most kind of people who've thought about the way in which Australian nature is constructed mm -hmm. um, and which has been drawn out very, very well recently by Jack Ashby in his recent book, um, Platypus Matters, um, which is this idea of Australia's, well, wildlife, um, geological formations, botany, and also projected onto the, the indigenous population, the idea that Australia um, in kind of Western imperialist discourses is a place which is primitive, undeveloped and reflects earlier stages within human, within kind of natural development. And this um, works on a whole lot of different levels within in the 19th century. It's a very clear justification for um, well, colonialism in the region. Um, it very much sort of leads into the kind of yeah, imposition of yeah, very brutal settler colonial systems and different form, well, new forms of agriculture, which really sort of um, yeah, condition and really sort of um, yeah, disrupt the continent. Mm. Um, and a lot of that is drawing off assumptions of Australian nature as being something other, something strange and something primitive. 
But conversely, that means that um, scholars who are interested in the development of life or in kind of constructing hierarchies of nature see studying Australian life and Australian nature as being absolutely crucial because it is it's in their mind it gives them a vision into earlier stages of development and because it's very often connected with these sort of salvage discourses of the kind of need to preserve and need to record it before it invariably disappears or goes extinct then um, there's a huge amount of urgency that goes into it so it's connected with again these ideological forces which are very strong in the 19th century but also yet yeah, incredibly disturbing if we think of them mm. from a modern vantage point. I think a lot of those trends are certainly still prominent in the Australian psyche and politics and all those sorts of things as well. Um, you know, certainly Australian animals are, are, are widely uh, talked about, you know, locally. It's not like we're, we're, we're disconnected from nature here. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, the, the actual sort of history of that, of that discovery is, uh, as I say, perhaps not very well known. Uh, I have a sort of friend, uh, Adele Pentland, who I interviewed last week, and she's a um, a pterosaur paleontologist, a pterosaur expert. She basically says the same thing. You know, she has a, a fantastic podcast as well. And she says, I kind of started the podcast because I feel like people just didn't appreciate the fossils we have here enough. Um, and I, th I think that's some of it. So, but Diprotodon is uh, is fantastic. And the, the one that you profiled uh, quite a lot in the book, uh, in the South Australian Museum I got to see last year. It's a uh, fantastic specimen. So what were some of the other kind of cultural assumptions, you know, perhaps globally that were um, uh, prevalent about mammals in, in the 19th century? And did that change very much over the course of the 19th century? Um, yeah, it's complicated in that there's consistently across the 19th century evaluation around mammals and sort of the main reason or some of the main reasons why they're conceived of as being interesting is because they simultaneously are used to show, show kind of superiority and inferiority within the within the kind of natural world so connecting with 19th century discourses around hierarchy but also tremendous diversity and tremendous variation so for understanding nature and understanding the construction of the modern environment, they become absolutely crucial. So on the first part around kind of hierarchy, then throughout the 19th century, then and really up until well, through the 20th century, and you do, do still see legacies of it in, into the present, is this very old idea of the great chain of being is still dominant in structuring mm -hmm. understandings of life and its kind of structuring. And this is basically the idea that you can put all of creation really onto a scale with the most inferior things at the bottom, which in the kind of classic religious conception would be kind of rocks and minerals. You would then move up to plants, then move up to worms, then to insects, then amphibians, then reptiles. Birds are always really complicated, so they tend to forget about birds and not try to structure them too much. But then mammals would be next, um, then humans, and then within earlier religious conceptions, this would then stretch through the, through the various ranks of angels and up until God. So you've got this kind of hierarchical vision of the chain of life which is kind of goes into a bit of an abeyance in the 19th century but is still remarkably consistent for structuring um well uh for structuring understandings of life for structuring museum displays encyclopedias and books and so on and so within this mammals are really really important really really significant because they show um, or are used to show um, the sort of latter stages of the chain. So showing improvement in the period, which is just um, kind of moving on from reptiles and the period which is just presaging humans. So that's one sort of aspect. But then for another aspect, um, while scholars and kind of cultural commentators in the 19th century are quite clear or quite confident at what exists at the bottom of the chain of mammals, which would essentially be monotremes, so things like the echidna and the platypus, then marsupials, so again part of this othering of the Australian landscape, and then a group they call the edentates, which is basically, well, animals which are, which are kind of characterized as being sort of toothless, which would comprise uh, kind of anteaters, armadillos, um, uh, aardvarks, and sloths. 
Um, they'd have those at the bottom, then they would have primates at the top for being the animals which are most like humans, and elephants also very high up for a very kind of rate for a complicated rate, range of reasons. But then the kind of whole middle area, so various types of carnivore, um, various types of ungulate, um, whales, bats, and so on, how these could be hierarchized is something which scholars aren't really kind of confident about or even really sure that that's a kind of viable pro project. And so that thinking about these animals becomes a way of thinking about diversity and variation within the natural world and um, how different animals become suited for their own particular lifestyles and their own particular position. And so, yeah, so the chain really does kind of structure thinking across the 19th century. There are sort of shifts in it in that um, as, as the kind of overtly religious dimensions of um, natural kind of history become taken away, then the sort of carry on up to God and the angels is sort of not overtly stated anymore. Um, and then when you get more prominent theories of evolution in the mid part of the 19th century, then it becomes something which is as much a developmental thing rather than a kind of static chain. So there's an idea that animals progress or maybe devolve um, up and down the ladder. Um, but nevertheless, this idea about the hierarchy of life based on this very, very old idea of the chain is really, really prominent and really continuous across the period and forms a lot of the reasons why mammals are so culturally prominent and why they're so widely used by scientists. Was the, uh, I guess, usefulness of certain types of mammals as farm animals and whatnot, mm. uh, as well as their familiarity, I think you mentioned dogs and cats and sort of domesticated animals, did, did that play much of a role in it or do yeah, you think it yeah, was, better. yeah. Yeah, very, 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 very much so. So there's a French writer who um, writes uh, um, called Louis Figuier, who writes a lot of popularizing books around the deep past, but also writes a big book about mammals. And his point is that mammals are particularly interesting and important to us because they are the prime auxiliaries of our society and our kind of and, and, and our sort of organization. So, um, yeah, so the, the usage and prominence of Mammals within the economy is really important. Also, the rise of pet keeping and kind of companion animals in the 19th century, the all new forms of pet keeping anyway, are really important. But th this leads to actually something that was really surprising to me when I was doing the, the initial research into the book. In that now nowadays, when we think about the promotion of the deep past and promotion of particular animals as being charismatic and interesting, then it will tend to focus on carnivores and big kind of dramatic predators. So things like Tyrannosaurus, if we're thinking about dinosaurs, or things like the saber-toothed cat, if we're thinking about prehistoric mammals. But in the 19th century, among the scholars who are constructing this new mammalian past in the public audiences who are interested in it, they often are really worried or really kind of uh, concerned about carnivores. They regard them as being sort of, on the one hand, potentially majestic and powerful, but on the other hand, um, living a sort of immoral life of having to kill other animals for their sustenance and also being threats to agriculture and yeah. threats to human society. So carnivores are regarded with a significant amount of distaste in the 19th century and most attention and most interest actually goes on to ungulates. So, and these, so things like, yeah, cows, camels, and their various ancestors um, generate a lot of interest, but particularly horses, and horses are really the kind of main icon of paleontology for much of the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century. I guess horses, again, do you think that's uh, due to their use in sort of military and, and expansionist um, endeavours? Yeah, that's that's definitely one part of it. So horses being um, yeah integral to well a whole range of different aspects of these um, yeah imperialist and extractivist economies and societies we've been we've been discussing about. So absolutely essential for militaries, absolutely essential for moving things around um, all through the nineteenth century. So we get railways coming in, obviously, but huge amount, but you possibly even the majority of kind of large scale transport is still horse drawn um, when we get to around nineteen hundred. So really familiar in that ways but also if we're just thinking about urban environments in the um throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century then um horse transport um so horse drawn wagons horse drawn kind of uh carts horse drawn sort of um, sort of omnibuses these are really prevalent and even expanding when we get into the late part of the 19th and early 20th century and so in terms of like large animals that people no matter who they are 
would see on an almost daily basis. And the horse is basically a kind of core model for that. So that, that's one particular aspect. And, and another important aspect is just the huge amount of interest that goes into horse breeding in the 19th century and attempting kind of, to kind of breed new types of horses, which on the one hand feeds into ideas about evolution and development and heredity in important ways, but is also one of the ways in which paleontology and people interested in paleontology connect with eugenics. And um, paleontologists, particularly in the years around 1900, are very much drivers within the eugenics movement too. So that's another um, yet yeah, disconcerting connection within the field in this period. It's a really kind of challenging field for lots of reasons when you look to history for, for those kinds of reasons, and it's linked very much with, uh, with extractive uh, economies and extractive approaches and colonialism and all sorts of things. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's important to uh, be be able to challenge and talk about those those topics. There's a lot of focus on museums as centers of power and knowledge in in your book as well, and you make the really interesting point that although universities in most fields of science come to be the kind of dominating institutions in paleontology, we see museums playing that role instead what do you what do you think that happened yeah um well, well i teach an entire module um, at my university on the cultural politics of museums so there could be um quite a lot of different things i could um say um essentially i think a lot comes from the particular types of museum that developed mm -hmm. over the course of the 19th century and particularly in the latter part of the 19th century when you have this thing which historians of museums talk about as being the new museum movement or the new museum idea and this is very much an international sort of drive to establish um, basically the type of large-scale natural, natural history museums that we know today. So with large-scale monumental architecture, with quite carefully subdivided different departments, each, each kind of drawing on a different branch of um, knowledge about the natural world, having on the one hand a research focus, but also a very strong public education focus, and a public education focus that often utilises techniques from, um, say, commercial culture and from new modes of presenting um, information. Um, and this is a really sort of major drive in the latter part of the 19th century and the early 20th century, and leads to the expansion of very, very large scale, very well funded collections um, in pretty much any major city you can think of. Um, often supported with quite a lot of money from either municipal governments in the one hand, so kind of urban governments, sometimes from state governments, but particularly in the US from large, large scale kind of um, yeah, industrial magnates. So people like Andrew Carnegie, uh, John D. Rockefeller and so on, put in lots of money into, um, into the kind of development of these kind of collections. And so museums in this period develop as on this kind of large scale. And on the one hand, the kind of the kind of research mission of the museum to kind of accumulate material and put it in storerooms, um, often exchange material with other collections. Um, for a subject like paleontology, which is very much based on the accumulation of stuff and the categorization of stuff from various different parts of the world. This becomes a subject with which this type of institution is really well suited to kind of um, to sort of focus on. Um, but then on, on the other hand, these collections are very much about public education and promoting particular ideological messages to um, their visitors and to the various kind of stakeholders within the kind of museum um, body. And so within that, paleontology and the life of the past becomes a really important field for which um, they focus on and which they devote a lot of resources. And this is um, on the one hand for having kind of large scale spectacular displays. And this is where dinosaur paleontology really becomes massively important in the years around 1900, when museums around the world are really just competing to, um, to kind of erect sauropod skeletons in their main halls. Um, but it also connects very closely with mammal paleontology Paleontology because, well, mammals are a lot easier to mount and a lot more abundant to mount than, than, than kind of dinosaur fossils are, but also they can tie in with these messages around hierarchy, around progress, and around variation within the natural world. Um, and also to kind of tie back to the point about, yeah, the Wellington Caves being very close to where you are, um, it's possible to make mammal paleontology in these sorts of displays kind of local and resonant in a way that you can can't necessarily do with dinosaur paleontology. So dinosaur fossils are 
obviously found over the world, uh, all over the world, but they're found in very particular locations where um, the exposures and the sort of surface and, and the kind of geological processes are particularly well suited to them. Um, so they're much rarer and much less abundant than mammal fossils. Um, so this means um, that um, museums and collections can quite quickly build up collections of local fossil mammals to show the deep past of the local territory. And this is done all over the world. So it's done in Australia with the kind of example of the Diprotodon in Adelaide being one really important example. Um, it's done in California where the fossils in Rancho La Brea, so this really productive Pleistocene kind of oil based site is really prominent. And it's, it's also done in London. So where, we're, where I'm based, where the kind of Pleistocene um, fossils um, of the Thames Basin are excavated in a huge amount of uh, yeah, volume of across the 19th century and put in a whole range of different institutions. And so also the kind of museum based focus of fossil mammals can make the deep past local in a really, really important way, which is um, very important for kind of, um, yeah, showing a very variegated past and a deep past, which is all around um, the kind of the, the kind of cultural institution in the audience. Yeah. The, the processes of taphonomy really work against, you know, the older you go, the harder it is to find any fossils. And uh, even you, you go back as, as recent as the Cretaceous and the, the face of the planet was, was much more radically different, whereas 20, 30,000 years, uh, you, you're looking at basically it looks quite similar to, to what we have today and therefore that local... Uh, aspect can be uncovered much more easily. I think that makes, yeah, a lot of sense in terms of the development of the museum. Were museums the major method for communicating with the public? What else was going on in terms of putting that message out there? Um, in the latter part of the 19th century, then, museums do become really prominent, and particularly the very well-funded kind of central museums in, in particular countries. So um, places like the American Museum of Natural History, by the time we get to the 1900s, 1910s, are producing their own magazines, their own postcard series. Mm -hmm. They're getting um, kind of news stories in the newspapers and in journals. Um, the, the, actually, the Australian Museum in Sydney also does very similar things. And it's a, almost like a pioneer in developing a really kind of high spec um, kind of magazine for its um, subscribers telling um, telling them about what's going on in the collection. So museums are really important for that, but then there are lots of other channels. Um, and if you go back further into the, the 19th century, then things do become a bit more varied. Um, so there's a lot of popular science books. These are really prominent um, and these really date back almost to the beginning of the field. Um, there are public lectures, often with demonstrations by the fossils or kind of drawings of particular fossils. These are really prominent. Um, these things called magic lantern slides, um, which are mm -hmm. like uh, kind of projections of reconstructions by the fossils or unextinct um, animals are really important throughout the 19th century. I've been to lots of museums where they have a whole a whole drawers of 19th century magic lantern slides with pictures of prehistoric animals. Um, as well as that, there are really kind of close links between um, paleontology and fiction particularly if we move to the latter part of the 19th century and onwards. And this is a really important way of, um, yeah, both um, promoting particular ideas about the deep past, but also connecting it with lots of um, ideologies around entertainment and empire and politics and so on. So um, Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, for example, is a yeah. really prominent book, which is very... You start to get um, yeah. basically the emergence of science fiction at that point, yeah, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, and yeah, and one of the kind of points is that um, for science fiction in pretty much any medium, then reconstructing or attempting to imagine prehistoric life is quite often the one of the first things that it tries out. So, in terms of kind of speculative science fiction, then um, yeah, people like Jules Verne and um, yeah, and Arthur Conan Doyle are turning to the deep past to to kind of develop these things. Um, get some of the first. Um, it's a dinosaur example, although there, there is a mammoth in it. Um, so Gertie the dinosaur in the 1900s, so one of the first pieces of um, kind of spectacular animation in the US. This is kind of trying out, um, yeah, new techniques, but using the life of the past as a kind of, as, as a kind of uh, experimental form in order to do that. And then you have the 
uh, yeah, the film version of The Lost World in the 1920s, which uses stop motion animation in a really kind of sophisticated way to bring dinosaurs to life. Um, yeah, so lots of different techniques are used to reconstruct the deep past in the 19th and early 20th century and promote it in very important ways. How did mammal paleontology in the 19th century sort of change our understanding of humanity's place in the world? Um, yeah, it does so in lots of different ways, really. Um, but to start with just a consistency around um, 19th century paleontology, then there's fundamentally an idea that humans are on top of physical creation, um, are superior to mammals. Mammals may be the kind of the best or the most progressive animals, but humans are in control. And and people that would, would now be living within an era of human dominance. So nowadays, obviously, we're kind of all animated by concepts around and debates over the Anthropocene, um, which is often being often presented as a, as a kind of quite novel thing. But if you actually look at 19th century ideas about deep, the deep past and periodizations in Earth's history, they have very, very similar ideas um, that um, the, the arrival of humans and particularly the arrival of large scale human societies represents a new era of creation which exists on geological terms. Um, they'll tend to refer to it in very kind of, well, both gendered and kind of human supremacist terms as being the age of man. So that, that'll be the term that they will use. And that kind of follows on from the age of mammals. And there are other kind of terms which are used. So there's one American scholar who presents quite a uh, quite an influential term called the psychozoic to, re to, re to kind of represent the kind of current era. Which is psycho literally, yeah, the connotations probably don't work quite, quite well. No, 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 no not in the same way. It would literally mean, yeah, the kind of the age of mental life, basically, mm -hmm. whereas I, I think in terms of intellectual life... It's, it's it, it draws on the notion of almost the enlightenment in a way. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. we're the enlightened animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the previous eras of creation are eras of animal strength and kind of force. Um, but with the coming of humans, you move into an era, uh, an era which is defined by spirituality, progress, intellect, and these other kinds of forces. So mammal paleontology really feeds into all of this by giving the kind of grounding to these ideas of, of, of this kind of new era of the age of man um, and being a period which is regarded as kind of high and majestic in many important ways but it's a lost era and it's one which exists in the past. So the age of mammals has either gone or only lingers on in areas which Europeans and North Americans are presented as being primitive and being present and presenting as being undeveloped. So there's a quite interesting kind of uh, set of passages within in Theodore Roosevelt's memoirs of his kind of various hunting expeditions in East Africa, where he talks about hunting in Africa is literally like being in the Pleistocene of North America. So this idea, so it's another way of kind of, yeah, uh, yeah, projecting on particular parts of the world as being kind of primitive. And so in some respects, this provides a really powerful ideological grounding for these projects of building new imperial systems, um, building new um, economic systems based around industry, extractivist um, economics and so on. Um, and then it also, of course, on conversely, on the sort of flip side, it becomes a way of um, presenting um, other human societies as being primitive and also belonging in the past. So again, the kind of analogies between um, sort of extinct animals and indigenous peoples, which I think came out in, in a kind of previous podcast um, as being a kind of major um, kind of prominent cultural theme. Um, this is really sort of dominant within these kind of discourses and becomes a way of yeah, presenting particular human societies also as belonging in the past with the prehistoric mammals and so again these kind of disturbing currents are very much present within it um but conversely particularly when you get to the latter part of the 19th century then there's often quite a lot of concern and quite a lot of melancholy around um the sort of damage that um these modern um industrial and imperial systems are doing and the way that they're kind of driving um animals and human societies towards what they would define as being extinction um and sometimes it's just presented in this language of kind of tragic inevitability like it's very sad that um in a hundred years time we won't have elephants anymore and hippos will only have because of um kind of kind of ivory and so, uh, ivory and so on um but it's an inevitable kind of set of developments considering the progress of society um 
but um, in other respects, it does also form the germination for um, the initial conservation movement, um, particularly in the US where you get kind of national parks being set up and parts of Africa. And um, obviously the kind of early conservation movement, and there's been a lot of very good work on, on this, is very often about preserving lands as this kind of invented pristine wilderness and is often connected with driving indigenous people off the land and kind of reconstructing it within the image of um, what a pristine wilderness is supposed to look like in the imagination of a kind of Western colonialist. Um, but it's still where a lot of the early conservations movement kind of originates from. And paleontology really forms a lot of the framing for that. The, I think the notion that you've moved from the age of mammals to the age of man rather than realizing that man sits within the mammals in a sense and and a particular version of you know although they kind of knew that intellectually right that, that it wasn't ready to be uh, acknowledged and and to be honest I'm not sure that we've got there yet but um, but uh, but also only a particular um, version of man in in that in that uh, sort of a characterization as well Chris Thank you so much for chatting about the book. I really, really enjoyed it. I'll make sure to put all the details to it in the in the show notes, as well as uh, some of those other books that you mentioned. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a fun. And thanks to Chris Manius from King's College London for that discussion of his fantastic book, The Age of Mammals, Nature, Development and Paleontology in the Long 19th Century. I highly recommend picking up the book if you can and having a read. Thank you for listening to this episode of Fossils and Fiction. We're always looking for more paleo stories to tell and welcome your suggestions through our social channels. You can also send voice notes via Spotify or social media. Podcast theme music is Sonora by Quincas Morea via the YouTube audio library. Show notes are available on the website, fossilsfiction.co. Please subscribe and rate the podcast on your preferred podcasting platform.